The night before my final chemo infusion, treatment number 12, I look for a photo that dad had given to me on his last visit to San Diego. In it, Lolo is 97 and I'm six. Lolo kept his, this photo in his wallet and dad finally passed it on to me 12 years after Lolo died. I stay up past midnight, past 1 a.m., past 2, looking all over the house. No one else is awake, so I get to sit alone in the living room with one lamp on. I stare across the room, stretching my eyes. Tomorrow is the last time I have to go to the, to the infusion center. I should be celebrating, but I'm afraid. My oncologist says that the cancer is gone, but I'm skeptical. The body carries everything that happens to it. According to a childhood friend, her tribe believes that after a traumatic event, the spirit leaves the body. Even though you can still function, that spirit needs to be called back. She says that the elders have a ritual for that. Otherwise, you're never whole again. Dad, I ask, do you believe in ghosts? I know the Capre, Aswang, and Duende. I ask him about Pasatsat. Dad thinks it's a fish, but it's actually the ghost of, a, of someone who was killed during or died during the World War II. Lolo fought in the Pacific Theater during World War II alongside American soldiers. Although he didn't die during the war, I can't help but wonder what happened to his spirit. Where did it go when he and tens of thousands of other Filipino and American soldiers were forced to take a hike 65 miles or when they were interned at the end of their journey. When I'm told that my cancerous lump could be lymphoma or leukemia, I'm also told that it's not genetic. It's just common for my age and demographic. But my body knows. Lolo's history is in my blood. On April 9, 1942, American General Edward King surrendered 75,000 Filipino and American soldiers to the Japanese, even though they outnumbered the Imperial Army. The Japanese were better trained and equipped with more advanced weapons. The recruited Filipino soldiers were not. To make matters worse, the Filipinos did not share the same tongue. They were all from different regions, provinces, and tribes, and there was no time to train them. So along with their American comrades, they were forced on a hike that historians clocked at five days long. Lola was on this march with no food or water. An uncle once told me, your Lolo said GIs with thighs far apart due to malaria and hunger had been a common sight during the death march. I know what he means. Their legs were so thin that their thighs didn't touch, were far apart. It's April 9th, 2010, and I've had a fever and night sweats for 10 days in a row. My body is getting more frail and I'm losing my mind. I'm disappearing. In the tub, I cry when I see my own legs floating. Have I ever been this thin? Will I stay this thin? I want to know, how do the muscles atrophy? How does the fat melt away from the bone? My path is not dusty or hot, but it is hard. And it is a march, and time slogs. I imagine walking alongside this line of men. Even from here, I can see the weight that they struggle with. I know that weight, but I do not know that life. I think I know a kind of death. But my uncle mentions Lolo's determination. He had been contemplating, he said, how he could finally perform an escape from the Japanese sentry along the horrible parade of sick and frail Allied forces soldiers. I try to remember that I'm the granddaughter of a survivor. In the evening, the temperature drops. You try tracking the days again, beginning with this night. Counting is the only way to remember that you're alive. Otherwise, you exist only to march, and that's unacceptable. 
The persistent heat smells like earth and death. The heat and the thirst make you crazy. Sometimes the march halts next to a stream, but your captors forbid drinking. Some men scream and jump into the water. In between gulps, men are shot. Others stab repeatedly with bayonets, but you, you stand your ground. These other men have no will, lapping like dogs in the ditches where the carabao wallow. Now that evening is here, your resolve increases. You know what hunger is, but you do not know this timelessness. You have never measured time by how pronounced your collarbone has become or the increasing width between each rib. You do not know despair without dignity. And for the past few days, you and ten, tens of thousands of men walk miles hunched over. From above, you imagine that the curve of each soldier's body transform that march into a succession of question marks. And you can't take it anymore. While your captors are smoking and talking, you turn to your neighbor and you say, let's go. He refuses. You run anyway, feeling as if cement blocks are tied to your ankles and you taste the humidity. You are so sure that someone can hear your pounding heart, your bony limbs, your wheezing, but the ground is soft, absorbing your steps. It's dark when you reach the ditch that you passed earlier in the day during the march. You jump in. You lie there among the debris, ants on your stomach. You're silent and unmoving. You hear the Japanese in the camp laughing, and you wait there as if you're already a corpse. Dad doesn't know any of Lolo's war stories, so I have to cobble them together from his brother's, a friend's, grandfather's a memoir, and other survivors' accounts. I cling to these stories once I am diagnosed with a blood cancer at the age of 32. I need evidence. And I find evidence like this online. This is the 57th Infantry that Lola belonged to. And my stomach drops. He is in this photo. But zooming in degrades that JPEG. The men become pixelated beyond recognition, merging into a smear of grayscale, a historical footnote. This is the first piece of photographic evidence that links Lolo to World War II, to the Bataan Death March, to the camps, to the guerrilla fight, to his citizenship, to our family's move across great bodies of water, to the connection I am trying to trace between his history of survival and my own eventual survival. Not all of these Philippine scouts survived the march or the internment camp, but I know Lolo survived because he escaped. He is in here somewhere, just as I am in here somewhere, in this CT scan of my cancer, trapped in this space between the collarbone and the base of my neck. Elongating the image allows me to draw parallels, to consider the history I've inherited, to actually see myself as a point of connection. When people ask me about cancer, how I survived, I don't know what to tell them. You just do it, I want to say. You suffer through it. I'm not a hero or an inspiration. My only choice was to exist and to endure but I know that I endured for other people. So I had to find a way to embody my own experience, and I looked for my dead grandfather instead. When I was given two potential blood cancer diagnoses, an old Filipino man, maybe in his 80s, showed up at our front door. I had never seen him in our neighborhood before. He wants to help me with yard work, Mom said. He needs to send money to the Philippines. What a cruel reversal. This old man, pruning our lone lemon tree, raking leaves, trimming weeds, sometimes by himself, while I was curled up on the couch, dying, or so I thought. 
He toiled in the warm spring sun, and I watched his small frame during the, doing, doing the work of young men just so that he could feel useful to his family here and in the Philippines. On his break, I offered him ice cold water and merienda in my limited Tagalog. I tried to hide my shame, my hiat. Then one day he stopped coming around, and I started chemo just like that. When I find the photo of Lolo and me, I hold it tenderly. I imagine it had been in Lolo's hand. I study the care he took to trim the edges down, and on the back, his shaky penmanship, and our San Bernardino address. I stare at the photo, and so many things strike me. The way we pose, the way we lean, how we look into the camera, how our faces resemble each other, our restrained smiles, and how we seem to glare at Dad. I look just like Lolo. I obsess over this photo because the history feels so heavy. Why does my face look like his? Why are we not smiling? How do I even know to make that face? I didn't talk to Lolo much. Between my Tagalog and his English, we knew very little of each other. We spent a lot of time together in silence. One summer, when I was eight, I watched him rock back and forth on his favorite chair, his eyes half closed, a long brown cigarette balanced on the arm of the chair. I watched the ashes build up like a glowing worm, growing longer and longer. Lolo, Lolo, wake up. Cigarillo mo. His small black eyes fluttered open. He cleared his throat, tapped the ashes into a glass bowl, patted my arm as if to say, thank you, granddaughter. I had never seen Lolo smoke the cigarette, and as an adult, I know that he just liked the smell, the ritual of it, holding it. I loved Lolo. And that thought makes me think about how we love, how we know whom to love, why we love, even when our interactions are limited or confined to quiet moments. Perhaps if I can begin there with love, I can keep moving forward with our parallel stories. If I can prove that love, not just survival and trauma, existed between us, then I can believe in the trajectory of my own life. He once carried this photo with him, now I return the favor. Thank you. Ms. Jennifer Miller.